I'm, uh, I'm Captain John from the Shinnecock Star in Hampton Bay. Don't leave a lot of regulars like John, you know what that is. Well, you'll hate because when you're on the boat there, she's catching 90% of the fish. But Shinnecock Star, I've been doing this over 35 years. There's a lot of different species to catch in and around Shinnecock as or any, anywhere else. I predominantly do a lot of skinny water fluking. Um, how many of you out there are fluke fishermen? Or you consider yourself fluke right. fishermen? Yeah. How, many, how many consider yourself fluke exactly. fishermen? There you go, there's two. Okay. How many of you have your own boat? Oh, that sucks. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, a lot of you have your own boat. Now, that's cool. Is, um, like I said, I've been doing it for 35 years. We mostly start, uh, we do start May 1st in Peconic for Porgies, weak fish. Yeah. That's it, folks. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought that was so cool. I thought that was Okay. If you, did, if you came in and you didn't get your raffle ticket, you could put one up before we do the draw. Okay? Rather than walk, walk around there. <clears throat> anyway, I predominantly skinny water flu. I've grown to love that for another reason. Well, number one, you're just catching fish. Um, number two, a fluke is a, a, a different fish in shallow water than it is in deeper water. You could fish 50, 60 feet, 70 feet, 80 feet, 100 feet for fluke. But the dynamics of catching and landing that fish. Oh, you want to say hi to Gina? Hi, yeah, Charlie. Hi. No, I don't mind. Just talk right over. She's right there. Hi, Gina. Say hi, Gina. Hi, Gina. It's a different fish in skinny water. Um, you hook a five pound fluke in five feet of water. I mean, I've seen times where these fish, they don't just sound and you get a few thumps as you're reeling them up from the, the depth, but they will tarp in on you, jump out of the water, dive. They're gonna do so much because they're so freaking green. I mean, you just hook them in five feet of water. And guess what? That fish knows he's at five feet of water. She knows she's in the water. So I'm not politically correct all the time. I try to be. He, she, it doesn't know <laughs> that, it, uh, yeah, that it's in five feet of water. So you're going to get a different kind of fight out of the fish. And what I tell most of my customers is, is go gently on it. You have to. You can't just start muscle on the fish. You have to take your time with it, know what it's doing. No one to reel, no one to pump. It's a little more of a job to land the fish in five feet of water than in 50 feet. So that's kind of got me hooked on. I'm like, I'm on cooked on this. And personally, I've landed like three fluke over nine pounds and under five feet of water. Mm, spectacular. It was spectacular. It was, um, I've also landed nine pound fish in 80 feet. For me, it's just, you know, okay, two thumbs, get them up. In there. It's a totally different ball. When you're fishing skinny water, oh, this, I have to relay this to you right. Last year, how many of you fluke fish? Well, the best part of the season in Shinnecock was the last two weeks of the season. The last two weeks, we had a phenomenal bite. And I didn't quite, uh, I'm glad you can make it. How's it going? Uh, Ronnie knows better than anybody else about all that. But we had the last two weeks of the season. And this, I'm trying to give you, drawing this to your attention because it teaches you that you don't, you think you know everything, and then guess what? You don't really know it. And the best way to be is open to learning. What the freak, what's What's changed? What's changed? Me and Jimmy Dallin on the Peace of Mind in Hampton Bay's a great charter boat fisherman, so it goes straight there. But he, we started talking about this. And I don't know if you had in your bays, ponds, whatever, a tremendous um, bait, bait reduction, steering, um, you know, um, bump, peanut bunker, uh, you know, some sand eater. Um, what are those little red worms called? Cinder worm. Cinder worm hatch. All these things were going on in the summer. And that's kind of a problem for me a lot of the time because it's like you're at a feast and there's so much food. Well, getting to the fish, you, you got to kind of figure it out. 
But rather than thinking that way, me and Jim decided, you know what? These, all this bait in the inlet, and this makes a lot of sense now, it didn't before, but all this bait that's in the bay and hatchet is now doing what you expect them to do. They're making the exodus. They're leaving the bay. They're going wherever they go next. I don't know. Where they're I just sort of noticed that the Chinook Inlet on Alco and Tide was like a giant chump pot. It's just dumping all this bait. You see the galbies dancing around, and bluefish, which haven't been around a lot lately. But this bluefish buzzing around, so it's, you know, it's a tremendous amount of bait. And I just started working in and around the inlet area, all the edges to the backside and everything. But those fish were there, and they were there because of all this bait, food, dumping into the ocean. It's a giant chump pot. And the quality of the fish, like this nine pound eight, I got the second, excuse me, 14 pounds eight, the end of the season, worst tide, I got backside of the inlet and he's feeding water. What was that fish doing there? He wasn't there all freaking summer when I'm trying to find him. He had to get pulled in. The quality of fish was different. And I just started fishing everything in and around the backside, front side of the inlet, to the bars, working all those areas. And the fish were there. If you were concentrating on fishing, you were gonna limit out like the last few weeks of fishing. It's just the way it was. And it was great for me. Oh, excuse me, maybe. Did I help you with anything? Want to get your coffee? Or? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just came to an understanding that that's what, this, that's what was going on. The quality of fish was different. These fish weren't there all summer. And they certainly, the ocean's been poor around Shinnecock as far as my find the depth, drip for a mile, and you catch a fish. That doesn't really exist the last five, ten years. It doesn't exist. You gotta skirt wrecks out there. You, you're gonna get hung. You're gonna get hung with the school because that's where the fish are, they're on the edges of pieces. So it brings me even more of my attention to fishing in the shallow water. It, you're not getting hung that much. You can work it if you know how to work it. And you can find these little freaking gems of, of where the fish are and figure out why they're there. So how many had that bite? Last half, last place. Where were you at? On the back side of the inlet. And Shinnecock? Yeah. yeah. And Shinnecock? Yeah, on the east well, side. What's up with you? Did you limit out? Yeah, every day. Plus. Right. <laughs> that doesn't happen every day. It's like the guy, the guy who caught that 14 pound, 8 ounce fluke. I, I knew the guy, he's a great guy and everything, but he's just not, you know, he's not into fishing that much. He's out there into just being with his family, having a good time. Is he here now? Got for 12 about him? Okay, so anyway, he's just the guy having a, you know, a couple of bugs, and not getting like an evening, but he's having a few drinks and by his kid there and everything, and he's like, cap, I'm hooked on the bottom, I'm hooked on the bottom. And I looked over, and, you know, you see that. If you're not on the bottom, then you're going to scream from the net net the fish. And that thing is hitting the deck like a halibut. It's the sound. I don't even have to see the fish. I hear it thumping. You know that thump? Yeah. It's yeah. like... Big fish thump. It eviscerates me. It's like, that. that's a freaking fish. Holy crap. I, I go get the scale. Dina's working out in the cockpit. What's going on in the cockpit? Come on, if you want. No, I have a bliss. You get a free trip if you want to the no, come on, I'll give you 20 bucks. <laughs> 30 bucks. I'll give you the boat. He's not. Anyway, this guy doesn't know. He's using a spearing piece of fluke belt. Bottom of the tide. I only have a wind drift. I'm just fishing up the trip and I'm trying to be where there should be fish, but I know better. This guy. We let this fish, it's in the boat, so all the deck, and there's excitement, pictures being, you know, pictures, Dina takes the fish, show the angle, every lure and stuff. And the guys are scared, they cap, is that a good fish? <laughs> <laughs> Were you there, Ronnie? No. I mean, the whole, the whole boat just dropped their jaws on. I wish. This monster's laying on the deck, and you're not sure, but that's the way it works. You can bring everything you want, every kind of, Rig anything you want, but if it's your day, it's going to be your day. And I got people limit out like plus, and they were like, "I don't know what I did." I said, "I don't know what you did, but you do it again." 
next time you go. Because that's all it is. It's like living on the dream. Let me take a quick talk about like the rigs that we've, we've been. This is the latest fashion. This is the ultimate fashion. Like I said, plain Jane rig, piece of fluke belly and steering. This guy gets the biggest fish I've ever seen on our phone. That's the way it works. We've had three basic rigs, and you can basically see this one it has a little chrome sinker on it. This is all courtesy of Tommy Teasers. If you don't use Tommy Teasers, this is a plug. This is a plug. Tommy Teaser. Tommy Teaser is the best teaser I've ever used to see man. And I helped him develop them. Everybody thinks they have to be big and gaudy, but you know the old max the hatch stuff. You know, sometimes you gotta go small to get the big ones. It's the way it works. If they're feeding on just just opened up fry and steering, you're gonna go small. And you're still gonna get big fish around, you're still gonna get it. Full tank of them. Anyway, there's three basic types of rigs we've been using. This one I can't think of the name. I'll leave this one. This one's been the killer in the bag for us. It's a biffle head, it's a jig with a swag hook on it. And you got the teaser, you have it a little higher up. Just a little short on leader. But you have this jig with a leader on it. Synthetics like this, I would normally personally use in this, I'd have a larger gulp on the bottom, smaller gulp on the top, and i just work it. I find that when you have the hatches, they do work, but this type of rig kind of works best when there haven't been any hatches. When you first start the season, there's no hatches. The fish are coming in because they know to come in. That's where the food should be. And they've developed instinct to show up. Sorry about that show up in the bag. But using something like this in the beginning of the season generally works out a little better with a lot of movement to it. You can jig it, vary your speed, everything, figure out what they want to see. But all that movement is because the fruit are now forage feeding. They're not targeting a specific bait. So you want to draw on as much attention as you can. You want to draw as much attention as you can to the bait. Generally the fishing is a little bit slower. But the fish in the spring are generally a little bit larger. So you have a better opportunity to get the fish with this type of thing. As I said, there's a biffle head. Biffle head has a sway of gulp. I usually put the gulp baits on it. How many do you use gulp? Blowfish can tear them up. Dollar a shot. <laughs> That's big bucks. I'd rather use the captain's bait. You know, he's steering or something. But since I'm paying $5 a pound, always bring your gulp. <laughs> Saves me a lot of dimes. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't rig a plain Jane, but everybody knows what a plain Jane is. Okay. Uh, totally prepared for the okay. I have several different rods here. As you can see, I'll use spinning or conventional. Look at that ice here. Spinning up convention. When, you, when you're on a boat like mine, and I'm, I'm generally, especially when the bait shows up, I'm working edges. So I'm bringing that boat up to like two and a half feet of water. The boat takes three feet of this. You know, I need three feet. I'm going to two and a half feet of water if the fish are up on their edge. And they generally like the edges when there's bait in And when you find the bait up on an edge like that, the fish are piled up. Granted, they're not all people. That's not the way it works. Because everybody, every fluke down there is probably on these corners that you're working. Because the bait thing. You start following the bait. Before you were like, generally fishing looking deep in Shinnecock, the deepest spot in Shinnecock is 30 feet. The deepest hole. There's only one. But you're generally working around. Fish can be not only in the early season, it's preferable to fish out corner tide. I've said this before because of water differential. The water, ocean water temperature is cooler than the bay water temperature. They like that ebb in the start of the, the early season because the warmer water like triggers something else, the fish. And when you're doing that and you're, you're fishing them while they're foraging, you got to work around and try to figure out, okay, where are they? They're not on bait. They're not, probably not up on the edge piled up. They're going to be just looking for a crab, a freaking, you know, boss, sea robin, mini sea robin, god bless you, that they can eat more sea robin, but they don't. But they're just looking for food, forage. And this type of stuff works. 
you're flipping it around, you're just attracting them, you know, from over there. They spread out. They're, they're looking. You're looking for them, they're looking for food. That's the way it looks. And the bait starts piling up, and you start working the edges. I like to see a lot of people, more people go to using the spearing, using the actual live type baits, whatever it is, or fluke buildings. Because they're on the meat. They, they, they look, they know where it needs to be. Now, saying all this, a lot of guys who use the giant, giant freaking gulps, you know, the, the savings gulps, they get big fish. But now the trick with that is, you, you're doing away with a lot of action and you gotta make that choice. Do I wanna fish four hours and a half there at Shinnecock Star and just look for those few big fish? Do I want some action? So when you go big on the gulps, you just know what you're targeting. You're look, just looking for the big fish. If you stay a little smaller, you're just gonna get fish, and you might get the big fish too, because it's so isolated on that one type of bait that you get them for that. Now, plain head, biffle head, and I can't for the life of me Besides knocking over my sodium. You don't have to get this sodium because I can't remember what the hell was freaking with. See you tomorrow. Chicken rib. It's a chicken rib. All it is, straight up and down, two drop loops. You can make the loops as long as you want. I tend to keep it small. High low, up to about two feet, 24 inches. And you get that sinker on the bottom and just pop it. I don't know if this is snap jigging, this is the new thing now. But you get that on the bottom and just let the sinker pull in. And I saw that this, this rig, even though I don't think I'll ever use it to outproduce this most rig, you know, the days of like trailing a three foot leader, you know, one three foot leader all across the sinker, are kind of over. But plain Jane still works, that whole thing doesn't work. This works great with that. This works great if you're... How are you doing? Get yourself. Get you anything. Oh, I just want to get a seat over here. Yeah. <coughs> That's that. Anyway, this, this chicken rig works really to me any either time. You want to either bucktail, heavy, when they're foraging, kind of switch it around when you're fishing the bait piles. And this works under either condition. You can put any kind of, like I said, you can put any kind of teaser on it, you can sculpt, you can use natural baits. But this rig seems to be the number one fluke catcher to me this year. So you put a different bait on each hook? Or the same you could go natural bait. You could just have two hooks. People do that, you know, with a piece of fluke ribbon. And a spearing on either one, go with the go, right. won't go. So either way. But it seems to work under either condition, you're on the bay or when they're foraging. And do you see much of a difference between the guys using gulp versus the guys using uh, bait on your boat? This is all like general, but general. generally natural bait you use when they're on the feeding on bait school, bait park. And then the bucktail. This is like the kind of way I, I never use, personally, I never use natural bait. It's just easier for me to go, I catch a fish, I don't know. <laughs> Not every day. Yeah. But I would switch to natural bait when they're on a bait and take a look at that bait. And you know, the maiden has gone over the years, she's like dissected fish, and you see what's coming up in their stomach. A lot of gulp does, but also, they're full of whatever bait they're feeding on. It might be small spearing. It might be peanut butter, but if you're doing like the wood thing, the gulf thing, you just try to match it as best you can. But I would say to somebody, you just use the natural bait. And that costs money. I'm telling them to do it. So that's, that's the way. I just don't, I just don't fish that way. We're going to just go like straight questions and answers. What's that? Five after two. What is it? Five after two. Watch that. We got booth number 13 here on Black Stocks. We couldn't hear his question. Sorry. He asked about the Biffle Heads. The Biffle Heads, the football head, 
for the sweat hook on it's a football leg. In the bag, in the skinny water, I'll use a half ounce, but sometimes it's good to go up to like an ounce, ounce and a quarter, depending on condition. But that hook, let's just talk about the hook a little bit. That swag, swag hook, if you're just giving it a light twitch, position, <clears throat> that thing's moving all kinds of nuts. You know, that hook is swinging. And it, it seems to get, you know, the, the more bites than the smile and bill does to me. That's what I use all the time. It's, it's, a, it's a great jig. Now, if you want to get biffle heads, they used to be uh, Bass Pro Stops, had them like $5.99 each. But now, since this whole thing exploded, and it was through Shinnecock Star that they used to fish that sword, because there was this guy, Orion, he's not here today, who was fishing it and wailing on him. <coughs> like every day he came, and finally I was just like, Frank, Orion, what are you using? I said, what, what, what the freak is that? Oh, yeah, Bass Pro Shops. Now that it's exploded, you can go on eBay and get, you know, get like 50 for. 40 bucks or something. It's different colors. Colors! Anybody have special colors they like using? Huh? The purple. The purple? purple? Alright. I'm a, I'm a chartreuse pink kind of guy. I like the gray. No, I am. I like saying it like that for whatever reason. Anyway. Pink for chartreuse has been live for me. Mm -hmm. Charlene said purple. Does anybody have a color besides white? I don't know if white works. Yellow. Pink. Yellow? Can I say yellow? I'm a pink yellow. Yeah? God, that never worked for me. <laughs> you see? That's what I'm talking about. I'm going to be using yellow to start next year. I never use yellow. Does anybody else have any questions? I got a lot of stuff I could talk about, but I'd rather just answer. John, about the season, I know the last two weeks was spectacular that you guys are baking in. How about the rest of the year? Do you have to go outside or a different time the bait comes in? In your area? It's generally, the bait is packed up on the bed for the most part. It has to be hard. It's a little small and very nice stuff. Because generally the date blossom happen like July, August. But they're really tiny. And even the schools don't really get on and have it so far. But once they start to grow, then they start getting getting on the bait. And then you look at incoming or outcome, then you look into our edges like spot. Try to deep drop it. You know, when I'm saying deep, like I said, max 30 in the bank. I don't leave a fish in like 10 feet of water. Do you have questions? The yellow works better in the morning. The yellow works better in the morning. It works better in the morning. I just do the tennis and the pet and I'll do the pets and I'll do the yellow. I switch the yellow, I start the yellow. And then I switch over to the yellow, so it's down. Did you talk about skinny water or did you just like this is deep? Fairly deep, like like thirty. In the bay? Uh on average. Yeah, the ocean the ocean does the same thing too. If you find it necessary to go out in the ocean, generally um, if you talk to a person who doesn't really like to go to any feet of water to catch a sloop, the fish in the beaches gives you the same kind of results. If you're riding down the beach towards the cheese house out of Shinnecock to the east or something. You find an edge, it's a good idea. If you got the drift, that's a big thing. If you got the drift, check out the edge. Because the bait will also, it's looking, the bait is looking to hide, it's looking for structure. If you find the structure, it might be just a little five foot, like small drop out in the ocean. It's worth a check, especially if you're marking, when you guys are boats, if you're marking bait, hit the edge. Do you find big fish among shorts? Hmm? Do you find big fish among shorts? Yes. Yes. He found, he found an edge by uh, Edge Road. Where? On, on the North Shore. On the North Shore. You know where the power, the local power plant is? You don't have to give me the numbers, that's too far. <laughs> <laughs> he found an edge, and every time we would go over the edge, we would find fish that were like an inch, inch and a half short. You know, 
that, that's an interesting question because I'm trying to think in retrospect of, you know, when there's action, I'm happy, I'm bending rock. Yeah, right. And you have the opportunity. But honestly, I think if you, if you chose to just, like, say, drift the deep spot rather than drift that edge you're talking about, I think what your results are going to be, you're going to, you're going to have to wait a long time for the bigger one. It's just you got to cover more area. Once again, drift gets involved. But you have to cover more area. Now it's going to get as much action. And as far as catching your biggest fish, I don't see that. I mean, you gotta, you got to think about it like my, microscopically. Microeconomics. You know, if you have, like in Shinnecock Bay, Western Bridge, as this guy knows all about, address this the, the bar goes all the way from the north side of the bay to the south side. You've got to get around the piano, you get behind the bar, or headed. If you're like fishing this area, if you, you can look at it as one big bar, it can drift any, anywhere, but that's not really what it is. There's currents that you don't see going on in the water, there's back eddies that you don't see. You might just drift from east to west, or west to east, or west, but there's currents on this. You can feel them sometimes in the boat. You'll feel the boat drifting and it kind of kicks out. You know, that's like a, a back. And those are great things to work, especially looking at this bar that's uh, west of the Palm Park Bridge you get today. You look at this bar. I'm not just looking at the whole bar. I'm looking at the corner. I'm looking to the back end. Well, you know, you might see a little whirlpool thing type thing on the surface. Like the water's just spinning grass around. And then you'll, you'll see an edge there. You know, all the physics involved in it. But there's a back eddy of sorts. And most of the time, you'll mark bait there, you'll mark the food. And then you want to hit that. And it's not just a whole bar. It's looking at the pieces of it. And we're like this, they sit like on this corner, this part of the tide, and you do me like every, and that's what I'm going to hit. That's the A spot right here. You go to hit it. Now, for you guys who have your private boats, People have criticized me for just being open about this. But generally, when I head off the dock, and I'm not bragging, it's just day-to-day -day stuff going on. But I'll leave the, my marina, and there'll be seven boats tied up at the dock, at the gas dock, like, you know, getting gas. No, they untie and they just come out and follow me. I don't, I don't blame anybody for doing it. Did you heckle me on that? I don't blame anybody for doing it, but I got to let on, on, on this before I, Oh, there's a great place, fishing place to test. Sometimes, if I see that many boats following me, I'll just go to a blank. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm not, I'm not joking. I'll go to a blank. And you know what? This teaches me a lot, too. Sometimes I'll hit that blank. There's fish there. Like, I just wanted to drop these people off and go to my spot. <laughs> you, you get Yep. Yeah. And, and it's kind of scary to me because I think I think I know. Wait, I'm not gonna finish the story. Yeah, it, it gets better. I'm gonna follow it. Too. It gets better. Sometime when I got the boats following me, west east of the Pomp Park Bridge is a big area where you, there's deep water all around. I'll just have the six boats and I'll just start to make a circle. <laughs> it's a big one, so you think it's just looking for something. Captain John is looking for something. And then I'll look back and they'll still be on me. I'll just make another circle. Rhea, have you ever been on my boat when I did that? Yeah, yeah. Because I, I swear to God, I've done it. And it's like the third circle, and then these guys are like, wait, he's screwing, he's screwing around with us. And then I'll just take off. And then I'll let the other two boats just call me. But I, is this sick or what? No, take it as a compliment. <laughs> No, I think I have a problem. Oh, you? <laughs> <laughs> the boat's following me. Yeah, not the guys following me. They're being smart. They can't get out every day. Right. Yeah, of course. Right. Of course. So, uh, to, to, to another tip for you, I know a captain who, when he sees boats following him, will dump a bucket of chum off the side That's of the That's not Jimmy Schneider, is it? Get the boats working. <laughs> <laughs> get the birds working to shake everybody and lose them. There's another tip for you. Every spot is Jimmy Schneider. Uh, every spot is Jimmy Schneider. He took Schneider. your jacket off. Huh? You were talking to me outside before, weren't you? No, no. But every was... spot is Jimmy Schneider. Yeah. No, I've done the popcorn <laughs> thing, you know. <laughs> get the birds working. You know, the eight-ounce sinkers, 
I haven't quite gone there yet. Oh, no. I need, I need therapy. I do need therapy. Okay, we're talking about bait and structures and stuff. A lot of my customers will complain, like Rhea and Charlene, about there's so much weed here. We can't even catch the fish. There's so much weed. That's when I see weed coming up, that's kind of a beautiful thing for me. And I'll tell you why. Because they, like I said, they're looking for structure to hide. They know they're going to be eaten alive if they don't hide somewhere. And they'll not only find like drop-offs, edges, rocks, but grass, seaweed. Look, they hide in that. There's fish there. The only thing I pleaded with my customers for, but Ronnie's like one of the guys that knows it. He's like, you gotta keep it clean. They don't, they're not vegetarian. They don't like their streaming, their broccoli. You gotta keep it clean. And that, of course, translates into a little work. And people get tired, pick up their cell phone, they start playing with chiclets or whatever. <laughs> and playing on and I'm like, what are you doing, Bob? What are you doing sitting down? Oh, there's too much weed here. I'm not catching fish. I said, well, you're not gonna catch fish if you're sitting there playing your video game. <laughs> On your cell phone. I'm oh, sorry, am I going on the boat here? No. <laughs> I feel like I'm filming my therapist right now. But you're not, and it takes a little work sometimes. You got to realize that these fish, they're pretty damn smart. I mean, they're pretty damn smart. But you got to realize sometimes you got to work. If you keep that bait clean, and I told people something, you're, you're going to see something. You're going to get to get the fish. You're going to catch the fish. But you've got to go on today. Sometimes it's clean drifting. Fish are coming up. Uh, uh, most of the time, if you don't work it, the presentation, presentation is always big. I have people come on the boat, and I understand this if you're green and you've never done it before, but you, you gotta, you gotta put the bait on so it, these are predators, so you gotta put the bait on so it looks like it's live food. They'll eat clam or anything. They will, they have, I've seen it happen. But you, if you're gonna present the spearing to them, a piece of sloop belly and want to trail off the hook and just be swimming through the water. And that's where you get your shots. You're doing it in the fishing right? Night fishing? Uh, I used to do that eons ago. You know, striped bass. No, for fluke. For fluke. Have I done it or? We, we have, I just set up for private charters for 5 to 8 p.m. That's not an open boat generally. I might do it this year. I haven't decided yet. But do evening fluke trip. A lot of people into food fish, but generally I don't. But sometimes if you have no bite, those are better than the phone that you're also And it's still not bad. You can go back to the same spot after you get thawed. You can only what? You can go back to the same spot after you get thawed and use either strips of bumpkin or strips of bluefish on a hook and you'll live it out. In the same spot that you tried fishing all day. You're saying you've done really well at night in the dark. I, I don't do that generally, but I have done well when people tell me, it's dark, you're not gonna catch flu. They do still feed. They have to have some kind of ambient light, I find, either a good moon glow or dock lights. But pitch black, I've never really caught them, you know, in my retrospect, I mean, I've never really caught them. You guys water or anything? No, I appreciate your knowledge. Huh? I appreciate your knowledge. Oh, thank you very much. Does anybody know what fluke is fluke the same this year? I don't even know. 19? Yeah, same so, so. Eight, 18 and a half still. 18 and a half. Is 18 and a half last year? Yeah, we got the paper. Should have heard the change in the season. Yeah, you guys got any question? I'm putting you to sleep here. You want some coffee or something? Joe is an 185. Joe. I my diet. Joe. Dr. Pepper. When you do the skinny water, do you find it white looks well? Why is it like always a go mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But like I said, for me it is making short juice. I don't know why. I've tried orange, I've tried yellow, you know, over the years. Just trying different things. All the new designs. Do you find it different color points depending on the players? Like, do you use, 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 do
I haven't noticed like the color differences on the, you know, whatever the water condition is or the, or the atmosphere condition. But it's generally, I don't know if you're like, well, deep and short trees is kind of in the middle and it kind of averages out. And mentally, let me say, it's just like, yeah, I haven't like an all line, like say, you know, they say you should go. I have a friend of mine who fishes striped bass, like endlessly, and he uses, at night he fishes bass, he uses black cloth tail. And I'm like, no. He's I, I didn't understand it until one night he took me out fishing the Palm Park Bridge and he's bailing him. And he's like, look, don't you see those bass? I don't see anything. I said, what? I see water. I see casting like 50,000 miles to get my chick down and not land anywhere I want. And then all of a sudden it just clicked. I'm looking and I see the silhouettes of this right there. It's like behind the bulkhead. It's some shit. And there's six of them. Six of them right there. And you see, you know where to flip them. But the same thing, I guess, works for the rigging user. <laughs> that black silhouette told me, like, okay, this might be silhouettes that are whatever wavelength of the thing going on there, you know, the scientific. Like I said, safe to me is like yeah, pink, pink shirt shoes. Also, the, the, the sparkle stuff. Now, if you look at Tommy Teasers, he's got a table out there. He's got a lot of flash in there. That always seems to do more. Oh. Anybody else? Good question. Three drives me insane. <laughs> no, you, you got to think about it on the standpoint of the main. That's a good question, too. It's a uh, braided. I fish braid on there, but I'm not using 10 pound, 8 pound braid. And the number one reason I don't use 10 or 8 pound braid is because when you tangle it, it is impossible. And I know I'm geriatric and everything, but it's impossible to take that apart and untangle it. You're going to get tangled. You're going to get tangled. I always go with like 25. But still, the diameter of the, of the thread is still way thinner than monosome, and it works good. Why go with like eight pound test? Unless you're going for a record. Oh my God. Other than that, I don't see any reason for going with like that. It doesn't affect the fish, if they bite or not. Fluorocarbon, I've experienced nothing with fluorocarbon a lot. Personally, eh, seems to be all right, but it doesn't do a hell of a lot better than a good monosome. It really does. Does it feel? You have to take the time to look at it. I've been going for more often than talking to only because he catch other fish besides. But I don't think I don't think the fluke it makes that much of a difference. I really don't think that. I know everybody uses fluorocarbon. Everybody. And I'm like going against the tide to use a bad pun under these circumstances. But it it really doesn't make that much of a difference. The biggest thing when you're fishing is to I mean, just lay it out like layman's term. Just go lie down the fish if you feel it's good, they're decent. Keep your rig in a good presentation mode. And obviously, keep it close to the bottom. So it always have to be right on the bottom. But you gotta be within five feet of the bottom, depending upon water clarity, you know, where you should be. You gotta pay attention to these things. And you're gonna catch more fish, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. You got any questions, Tom? I get to all your questions. Huh? Good question. Can you repeat the question? And now I'm going to tell you a little story. She asked me, if, do, we, do I fish the tide? Well, tide is everything. But I go from 7 to 11 and 12 to 4. So is tide always everything for me? Not so much, because I'm going. <clears throat> the, the key is that I go out there like every day and hopefully I have some knowledge at uh, you know, bottom of the outgoing tide, where we should be, where we should get to fish. If you're picking the best tide when you're going fluke fishing, I generally, you, either, you have to make reservations with me, but you either ask me which would be best, usually I'll give you a decent human answer or I'll come back and deal with what difference does it make. But generally, it's top of the in, beginning of the out. And why is that? Movement. Hmm? Movement. 
I go to Vegas once in a while, right? I go to Vegas. Absolutely. You gotta hedge your bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I can't talk about anything that happened in Vegas. Today. But you gotta hedge your bet if you really want to cover your bases. Because if you're going out on that boat and you want to pick the prime conditions to catch fish, there's so many variables that you're not taking into account. Even if you pick top of the end and beginning of the out, you're hedging your bet because there's wind. You know, we've all heard wind against tide. That's not always a bad thing. But there's wind against tide, the water's cloudy, whatever, whatever different variables. You can't play all of them. But my, my choice would be top of the end, beginning of the out. Uh, early in the season, you know, beginning of the out, it switches. Uh, top of the end, mid-season, all general favorite. But yeah, you always, you're always playing the tide, always playing with the wind and the conditions that they create. Wind against tide isn't a bad thing. The only bad aspect of it is you tend to weed up a little more when you got the wind against tide. But if you get on a spot where the fish are, to me, that translates, you're on the spot for a longer period of time. And if you, as the fisherman, realize that, he's got to be staying here for some reason, right? I gotta be. So I'm just screwing around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let somebody screw around. Hey, but he's got to be saying, so you, you as the fisherman, have to keep the bait presentable and clean. And hopefully you'll find those fish that I'm trying to put you on. <clears throat> the reason I'm there is, yeah, Who else? Come on, you want to give some Shinnecock knowledge? It's a lot of times, a lot of times you're leaving, it's not because the end of the ship. You might just go flop, go into that spot. You probably left with a quiet down and boom, I hit him. So it's hard to tell. <laughs> Which brings me to my next main statement about fishing. It's a quick, short story. But never, you all wonder like what's the best, what's the best. We start you when you come on the boat with the basics. That's the way to go. When you do anything, you learn how to play tennis, you start with the basics. You know what I mean? You don't start the high end, back end on the move. You start with the basics. So I'll start with the basics. But you have to like change. Start to change and see things that work for you and things that don't work for you. And that's like, that's like the essence of, of fishing, is the learning, is the whole process. When I go out there May 1st, generally porgies are pretty easy to figure out. <clears throat> when I start fluke fishing around the beginning of June, I'm like, it's like almost like I'm starting over again. There's no, I mean, it's a blank page, blank canvas. It's like you're, you're just learning again. Because those fish, 90% of the time, all your predictions and log books aren't going to put you on the fifth. You're looking at what's going on today, what's changing today. And every year, as I look at the log books, it's changed. I'll go out on the Pong Club Bridge. I'm so like, into this. I'll go out on the Pong Club Bridge. And I'm looking, just looking at the bay. There's nobody out there this time of year. But the water's clear, and I can see the bars, and I'll take pictures of all the bars, west of the bridge and east of the bridge, right off the Pompo Bridge. And then I'll compare them to last year's picture. And those bars are constantly shifting. They're not where they were last year. They just keep, keep moving along. They keep shifting. And you've got to, okay, this, this, this corner's not here. This bump's not here. Uh, what's there? There's like a new one. I know I might hit that. I know I... You start making all these lists. This well, is kind dredging of dredging the inlet again, so that's going to change the contour again. The what? A dredging the inlet again, so that's going to. There you go. The Man is creating change for you now, too. Right. So now you got to look for the edges there. They, when they dredged it last time, like six years ago, they dredged the east cut and shrink up there. They took out like half of this gorgeous freaking sandbar that dropped off into 18 feet. It was an edge. And I look at my pictures, and they, they just fucked it up. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not even just the weather and like right. you know Mother Nature doing it. It's, it's we're doing it too. Everything is constantly changing. By the way, right in front of the dock, in front of Oakland's dock in Chinica, I would fish that in a heartbeat. But there's two problems with me. I'm just that's just right outside my arena. There's no. You know, when you stop in here, you know what if the fish. The fish sitting along that dock structure again is amazing. The problem is there's a lot of structure. So you're gonna get hung. Huh? Are you fish there? You fish in front of Oakland? Yeah. Yeah, that's good, but there's a lot of hangs in there. 
they get a lot of wash in the huh? they get a lot of wash in the commercial boats. Boats in the decks. Because I, I fish on the, the north side of the channel in front of the dock. I worked that far along that side. Inside near the dock, I know the fish are there. I catch them off the dock. I pull them off the boat. It's just too many, too much stuff to deal with. Yeah, if, I had a, if I had a recreational boat, that would be a prime target of mine. You know, if I got three guys that really know what they're doing. But if you got 20 people on board and 10 of them really don't know what they're doing, you're going to get 10 rods just hung up. And that's, that's a lot of work. Not for me, I'm sitting in the wheelhouse. The big stuff doing that <laughs> grind and keep it going. What about over the world over here, like uh, near Prime, near the buoy there, the 90 degree turn and that neck of the woods? Good question. When I'm fishing Pecan, I don't know if you guys, any of you guys remember Blackback Flounder? Yeah. Winter Flounder? Yeah. No, that was me, yeah. 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 I still get people in the spring for St. Patrick's Day. And I'm like, I don't want to catch the last one. I just, it, it got difficult. But back in the day, they asked me about Shinnecock Canal. Are you talking about the south side, right? Yeah, yeah, the south side. Shinnecock Canal, south side. Going into Peconic, we're fishing for these. Then when fluke start biting, I'll give you like, we, we're done when we caught a lot of 40s, we're going to go look for fluke. But that, when, either when the locks are open or the locks are closed, is a great early season spot. Because I used to go flounder fishing for blackbacks, and I called them the flatfish trip because I could catch fluke and flounder and keepers. And this was then, this amazes a lot of people I know about, you know, water temperature and all that stuff. But th I'm talking like Shinnecock Bay is like 48 degrees, Peconic Bay is 46. This is freaking bone chilling. I mean, guys, you don't want to come out of a swimming pool at this water temperature. You know what I'm saying. Anyway, this is like amazing. But when those locks are open, when the locks just open and the water starts to trickle through, you have that same effect, that slight temperature differential. The fish are coming into the bay, they're lined up at the canal area there. The locks open, they get this little wisp of warm water and it turns them on. And I'm talking, this is, you know, the bars. You know, when you're coming through Shinnecock Canal on the south side, the bars like that are off to the south. Mm -hmm. Fishing the edges of those bars. I'm talking in April, you know? Yeah. March, April. We're catching fluke. In the south side yeah. of that pool. Yeah. And you the people are saying, there's no way you're there. catching fluke right now. Well, you've seen the pictures kind of posting, but it, yeah, that, it's just that water temperature. There's no bait there yet, but now you're probably starving. They just came in from the ocean and whatever they do on the continental shelf. But they just, that little water temp differential makes a big difference in, in the spring. That place clears out after everything starts to even out a little bit, the fish get smaller. But generally, the early hit, when, that, when it, the sun starts shining a little warmer, that's a great time to hit that area. Yeah. It's all based on temperature. That's all, it, to me, that's all there is there. It's just that temperature change. And, and you'll see it by the number of guys that are lined up in the canal. When the locks are open and the temperature changes to be away from the Great Peconic is coming in. Peconic water is warmer, comes into Shinnecock, which is a little colder. We yeah. had a reverse. Yeah. But Shinnecock is generally a little colder because yeah, the ocean yeah, so it warms up a little bit. In the it's just a warm. slight difference. It's not a big, mm -hmm. big difference. But just got enough over here. But you know, the, thin, the larger fish clear out of it, and you'll still catch float. Yeah. Won't be short. Because we've caught fish there on and off, and I never realized why sometimes and why not other times. Maybe it's got to do with, you know, we've never looked at the. At the, at what, the, what the locks would do, you know. Well, it, it's definitely to me the temperature change there. I don't care what you kind of rig you have on there. Why are you sending this in the pool? We're supposed to be over here? This is the last one anyway, so. Huh? This is the last lecture anyway. You're not going anywhere? No. I like this guy. <laughs> Keep talking, they'll be teaching us. That's pretty much what he said. What are we So you, you look at it, all these variables, you look at it, weather condition. Uh, which includes wind. Uh, you're looking, you're looking at structure. There's so many different variables you have to throw in. The moon. We haven't even talked about the moon. I mean, I generally I'm so busy I haven't even made any diagnosis as far as how much the moon affects it. I know when the tide is screaming, generally the fish bite drops off. If you're in a screaming tide, you'll start sometimes like incoming tide. Backside of the inlet, I do one drift across the flats. I'm going 
Yeah, you know, catch some flu. Right? Man, that has to be one fast flu to catch up with your fish. Not to say they won't, but there might be a place where it's a little better condition. Generally, my speed that I like seeing is one a knot. <laughs> yeah, like 1.2, 1.5 is cool. You start getting to the two knot range, you're gonna see a drop off in the number of fish. I don't know where, if where you're fishing, if you're drifting that fast, it makes it different. Definitely makes it different. All of these variables are going to play on you catching more, more fish, essentially than anybody else on the boat. And there is some kind of competition going on there. There always is. Like Ronnie over there. It's like bailing fish, like the whole freaking trip. And people are just like, what the freak? Is he you? What is he doing? Well, he's, he's fishing. He's not sitting there playing with his cell phone like this gentleman. Yeah. <laughs> of course we're across I just love that. So I'm not fishing now. <laughs> but staying with it and just paying attention, it's keeping it really, keeping it as simple as you can and still catching fish. That's always the way I look. I've reverted to, I use my biffle head jig and a teaser, both with, um, you know, those fake wigglers, whatever they're called. So you put on those and that's what I want. Because it's the most comfortable thing for me. Comfort in what you're using, you have to, you, you really, it, it sounds like spiritual and all this thing, but you really have to believe in what you use if you're going to catch fish. Otherwise, you're disappointing yourself before you even get started. So if you, on the bond boat, if you do want to try something else, we'll offer that to you as best we can. But, you know, do your research. See what's on. You can check us out now. I just got my website up again. I don't know how many of you guys are out there are cyber guys. But I am not. But I have to get the information out, and we get it out. I'm going to get it out to the website, Instagram, Facebook. You could see now the way the whole fishing experience has changed. It used to be like for my business 35 years ago. I go out to, I got my loyal guys that come every day. Now, a lot of people do what I call internet fishing. And, that's you, and it's, a, it's a tool now. I'm just not freaking used to it. You can go and find out when I'm catching, if I'm catching fish, what I'm catching, like almost by the hour. That's freaking amazing. Don't you think? <laughs> I used to have guys that came out two, two, didn't sit for two months and they just get on the boat. What's going on? Oh, well, you know, I'll just say to them, well, we're not boogie fishing anymore. Get to see bass, white chumps, chumps and striped bass. Okay, okay, now it's like, it's like a different, it's a different world. But using it to your advantage, especially with all these big steps in the cyber world, you know, Instagram, Facebook, you have what I caught that day, you know, if you're thinking about coming tomorrow, it's a good day, but you know the old saying, that was yesterday. Should yeah, that happens. Should have been here. That happens, that happens yeah, a, lot. <laughs> a lot. A lot. But it's, it's, it's even more difficult for me, I mean, looking at the whole picture. I mean, personally, I think you should decide you found a captain that you think is the right guy, right? He's the captain. And know, you have to know that that captain is doing the best he can to put you on fish, right? Doesn't that make sense? A lot of people don't really get it. But that's, honest to God, me or any other captain that I know of, is really always trying to to work it with you, trying to find your fish. It's what we try to do as a whole. I don't understand. I'm, I'm like chief cook and bottle washer now on the Shinnecock store. I answer the phones, you know, do this, do that. Everything except the deck, everything's on me. And I'm free, I'm not a great phone personality. Okay, I get it. But I have to, I have to share this with you. If you're planning on going fishing on a boat, Laura. Yes, you captain. If she's, she's experienced this. This is my shrink, Laura. Really, that's my shrink. She travels with me. But if you're going to book a spot on a boat, it's a new boat to you, you're going to try it. When I get questions like this, I kind of have a little problem. Like, I don't mind, they're like, so I want to go fishing in two days. Yeah, we go 7 11, 12, 4, when you want to go. Well, I got a few questions for you. No problem. You know, are we going to catch fish? <laughs> and I'm like, 
Why? Well, I'm being personal, man. I hope you do. I hope you do. It's not even the phone name. It's like on the phone. But I hope you do. You're like, oh, okay. Okay, if, if we... You know, I really want my whole family to catch fish. I'm like, yeah, well, we're going to do our best we can. We're going to set you up. We're going to do it. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, let's say we do catch fish. Can we keep them? Well, they got to be that, you know, a certain size. And I, mean, but I, I really want you to guarantee that, 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 that we're going to catch some fish. Look, again, I'm still tr trying to hold on. I'm not not good. It was you that called me, right? I'm trying to hold on. And I'm saying, yeah, you know, like I said, we're gonna do the best we can, do the best we can. I just don't, I just don't know if we're, wait a minute, okay, time out. Time out. Look, you're gonna spend $240 for your family to go fishing, right? Yeah, yeah okay. This is what I want you to do with the money. I want you to go to a fish market. <laughs> Honest to God, I've said that. I want you to go to a fish market, and $240, you can buy lobster, you can buy shrimp, any type of fish fillet that you want. And get a lot of it, and you're going to have changed. You won't even have to tip the guy behind the counter. Guaranteed. Yeah, yeah but, but Captain, I want to go fishing. I'm like, so that's it. That's what you have to get in your mind, that you're going fishing. I don't know 100% you're going to catch. I don't know if you can fish. I don't know what you can do. That's, that's always the best thing when you get someone who's from like a city or someone who's really near the water and they go out into nature and they're just like, okay, you go out the woods, so you're going to tell me the future. You're going to read the future for me. So you go out the woods. It's a tarot card. But we, we, but we all have to understand, we're all fishermen here, I think. We all enjoy it. We understand the aspects of fishing. It's not just catching fish. It's you know, Charlene's bringing me brownies, which she didn't bring me to the show. You know, there's, there's all these things going on. Getting to know people, you're learning how to better catch fish. Most of them, I call them barometers on my boat. The guys that really know how to catch them. I'll go to a spot and I have five guys on the deck. If I don't see that, I'll just look at them and I'll get in. And then I'll know this is not going to work right here right now. But those are my barometers. There's the people that just go for it. Once in a while, go for it, they'll help you all we can. But you have to put a little effort in, too. Especially with skinny water fluking. It can be kind of a finesse. Like, how many of you fish blackfish? Like, you all know that there's a touch that you have to learn. And the only way you learn is through experience. That touch with the blackfish. Understanding how they're biting right now. How they, the whole thing. And then you'll be hooking up more blackfish. It's the same thing with fluke. If they're in a chase mode, this is one thing that... It really irks me. Everybody for attending today's show and for the vendors for uh, providing us with everything you did. Thank you all very much. Raffles will be thrown. I'm going to just pick the numbers. Usually I pick a cute young kid in the crowd. And you know, Rhea might come up. Want to pick the numbers in? Come on, Rhea, you're embarrassed. Come on, let me embarrass you. Okay. 34 half day trip. Get out of here. You said that. You tried to take more. No freaking way. Let me see the number. I took that up before, like two o'clock in, and you got it. Yes. <laughs> now that was weird, because I was giving you a hard time about it. Okay. I spilled soda on the t shirt and hat here, but you come by the booths, I'll give it to you. 39. Who said bingo? <laughs> Nobody. Nobody? 30. 39? Going once? Person they left. Guy left. Yep. See? I got you see, it. never left. Yeah. <sighs> Anticipation. This is for the hat. 13, lucky 13. Right here. Where? Yeah. You got a hat. I give you yeah. that hat. And for the t shirt, there's one size up here soaked in my Dr. Pepper. 15. 15 for the T. Once, twice. No 15. Try again. I'm going. 12. All right, guys, thank you very much. If you want a flyer, just grab one up here. Thank you. You got the t-shirt.